are back. Not sure why that ended. Do you know where it stopped? No, I can't see. I didn't see my lecture. I can't see my lecture. So you can go forward one. Thanks. And go one? Yep. Perfect. Um, and so it's usually a 30 minute appointment. So it's a ton of information. I feel like I'm just opening up a fire hydrant to some of my clients and turning it on and asking them to drink. It's so much information. So we're going to send you home with some handouts um, so that you can go back and read. And then we really try to make ourselves accessible so we can answer any questions. Um, the most important points that I have to talk to you about when you're in the exam room, these are, these are the ones. Um, number one um, are diet, 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 diet. We talk about diet, diet, diet all the time. Um, in the wild, these guys are foraging for miles. They spend most of their time preening and foraging for food. Um, that's what they do. And so we've taken them out of that environment and we've put them in captivity and we've given them um, just like a buffet of food. So they're not exercising, they're eating, spending an enormous amount of time eating. They don't have to search for their food. So we're really predisposing them to become fatties. So, um, so what we want to make sure is that they're eating healthy. Um, and all species are not created equal. Um, this is really important for birds, where we talk to you about pellets all the time. Um, there are two species that um, I was just talking to my associate veterinarians about that shouldn't get um, the high dose of pellets, and those are eclectus birds and cockatiels. Um, and so we'll adjust their pellet down just a little bit because their body can't process the minerals as well as the other birds. And so in cockatiels, we'll see some renal necrosis and kidney disease. And in my eclectus birds, we'll actually see neurologic disease where they'll wing flap and they'll toe tap um, and they'll present often for that reason. And so usually when you adjust the diet, it goes away. Um, typically, besides those two birds, you wanna have a mixture of about 60% pellets, 30% fresh food, fruits and vegetables, and about 10% seeds. Um, so the seeds that you choose are important. So we want to do healthier nuts. Um, sunflower seeds are super high in fat. They are of no zero nutritional value whatsoever. Um, however, there may be birds that are super mot motivated by sunflower seeds. And so that's the perfect seed to use for training. So we wouldn't give that bird its favorite food at all unless it's during a training session. Birds are so smart. Training them is so easy. Um, and it's really, really cool and wonderful to do. We'll come back to that. Um, we're going to talk about cage, substrate, bottom of the floor. Um, again, perches, so many, um, so many things I've already said. This is critical for me to talk to you about. Um, another thing that's near and dear to my heart is foraging um, and helping these birds have an environment in which they're actually looking for their food. So once again, these guys should be looking for their food for a large portion of the day. Um, and in fact, they're just set there with their buffet. So um, there's so many toys that you can get out there. You can make them. Um, in our handout, we have, and if you guys email us, we can give you the websites of making them or purchasing them. You can start out really small by putting a, a seed or a yummy treat inside a paper towel or a balled up piece of paper and having them rip it and find it. Then you can get really complicated. Um, my African Grey is extremely smart. and She outsmarts me and figures out my toys like in 48 hours. Um, but there's unlocking um, and, and just wonderful foraging toys that you can get. And so that's where a lot of her treats will go is in that. She's super motivated. She will spend hours figuring out the toy. And so she's not sitting in her cage doing nothing. She's a very busy bird. Um, there's a wonderful DVD called Forging in Captivity, um, and you can get that on Amazon.com. It's lovely. It's short, um, and, and it just talks about how important foraging is. We talk this sunlight, um, so we're going to make any adjustments in the environment with sunlight if needed. And bathing for me, um, I'm a purist. I like water um, for bathing. It'll be every once in a while, I'll add fresh aloe or maybe some lavender drops into the bath but it's for a particular reason. Maybe a bird is itchy or maybe a bird is stressed out, um, but usually water. I've had some awesome clients tell me that 
um, what they've done to get their bird to take a bath on their own because there's so many clients that tell me that they buy this beautiful fancy bird bath and they put it in the duck bird's cage and the bird is like, I don't even know what that is. I'm going to take a bath in my water bowl. And so they're squeezing their fat butts like down into the water bowl. And that's what my bird does. And like, she's trying to get bathed in there. Um, and so, and then I've had clients who tell me that their bird is terrified of water. Like you go to do a gentle spritz up top and the bird gets scared and freaks out. So a couple things you can do, we've all got our cell phones, which is super nice. So we can put it on a rain sound for the bird and you put it on a rain sound and then you use a spritz. So they hear and they instinctively know what that rain sound is um, and they'll get ready for a bath. And so it's not nearly as scary for them. If they're still scared, then you need to hide behind something and aim the water bowl, bottle way up so that they don't know where it's coming from and it's just a really gentle light mist that's that's coming down on them at least weekly um more with the cockatoos cockatiels my bird is super dusty so those kids need um baths but penelope um she like i just put her in the sink and she'll just take a bath in the sink um so so sunlight, bathing, toxicities, this is a huge one. Um, toxicities, we're gonna talk, let me talk about air quality first because that's quick and easy. Birds are, du birds are dusty, dusty, dusty. Um, they're also extremely sensitive um, and that's gonna relate to our toxicities as well. So if you have more than one bird, you need an air filter. Um, I like Rabbit Air is a wonderful company um, that does a great job with their air filters. And so you need to have it in your bird rooms. Um, if you have just a really dusty bird, you might just want to have it um, because these air filters, of course, are, are purifying air for the bird to breathe. Um, and birds that are like a cockatoo that's super dusty in a very small room that gets closed, this bird is, is going to have respiratory issues because it's potentially not bathing like it should and it's going to inhale its dust. Uh, birds are very, very sensitive. This will lead into the toxicity. What you smell, they smell a hundred times more. Um, if you are burning a candle um, for fragrance, incense, a cleaner, any type of chemical cleaner, um, and you can smell it, they can smell it a hundred times more. Um, the thing is that birds don't breathe in like we do with the lungs and then breathe out. They breathe in their lungs uh, and it, they lungs, and then it, it's transported throughout their entire body in um, air sacs. And so it goes into their long bones, it goes into all their air sacs, which are from the tip of their head all the way down to the bottom of their salomic cavity in their salomic air sac. Um, and so these chemicals get in there and they're, they're, they're extremely dangerous. And where they might just be irritants and cause inflammation of the nasal passages and sneezing and upper respiratory, chronic upper respiratory issues, they may, if it's um, something so toxic like burning Teflon, kill your bird within five seconds. So Teflon is very toxic for these guys, nonstick surfaces. It's not cooking on it, it's actually the Teflon burning. So if you're cooking something, you leave it for just a minute, it starts to burn, the smoke uh, rises up, your bird gets a whiff of that, your bird is gonna come in acute respiratory distress and there's a chance that we can't save it, a huge chance. So when you you know uh, decide to be a guardian of a bird, um, you need to, to decide that you want to potentially be a chemical free house. Vinegar and water is a great way to clean. Essential oils are safe with birds. Um, I actually use essential oils as treatment for them often, um, but it's in lower quantities and you can use essential oil cleaners. Um, I don't burn any candles in the house. If it's a special occasion, I'll burn maybe a soy candle, but I'll put my bird away from the area. Um, if any of my kids are cooking and there's some smoke that comes or whatever, my bird goes outside. Um, so we're all very, very aware and careful with these guys because they're extremely sensitive. Um, toxicity is not only in the air, but also in the food. Um, and so there are some things that birds can't eat and they can't eat avocados. Um, they can't eat caffeine. They don't, they shouldn't be drinking tons of coffee, although my bird loves to drink coffee, so every once in a while she gets to it and gets a sip. Um, chocolate, um, those are things that are real no-nos for them. Um, so that's, those are really important talking points that we're gonna talk. Um, and so, let me see. yeah. Okay, 
And so um, just my last slide, because I've touched on everything else, is just how to be the best possible owner for your bird. Um, it is most certainly making sure the husbandry issues are corrected. I mean, that's the first thing that we're going to talk to you about. And you may come in for a feather picking bird or a bird that's screaming and you think it's a behavioral consult, um, but really it's going to become medical until it's not. Uh, once it's not medical, then we'll move into the behavioral realm. But we always want to talk, we always want to talk about behavior at the same time. So I have an owner that comes in with a baby cockatoo who's stroking the cockatoo and who is letting the cockatoo like get all up inside her, his or her mouth. Um, this is really setting up huge failure for the cockatoo. Um, and I'm sorry I pick on the cockatoo a lot, but they're the ones that we see often for mutilating themselves because they've been devastated in their past um, and for having to be rehomed because of poor behavior. So it is a species that I care about. And the African gray is another one um, that really gets bonded to the owners quickly. And so it's all fun and games when they're babies and you're petting them and you're feeding them warm foods out of your mouth, but they hit puberty at two to three years old and they become little naughty teenagers. Um, and the hormones start kicking in and then no longer are you mommy and daddy, but you do become mate potential for them. And so mates, they, they, they mate for life in the wild. And so they don't understand why you leave them. Um, stroking down their back is a huge reproductive stimulation. Um, you'll get masturbating birds on your hands. Um, it's something that, that certainly we see a lot. Um, and then, you know, that could lead to producing in females, producing eggs and then overproducing eggs and then depleting their body of calcium. So there's lots of reproductive issues that we get really worried about. But if you start um, with more of a hands-off approach and treat your bird like they're a flock species, then you're going to have the greatest success. So Penelope doesn't get to be on top of me and, you know, hugging all over me. Um, she stays on a perch beside me and she's wheeled around throughout our house wherever we are so that she is a member of our flock. She's not mated with me. She's not mated with my husband. And she is, um, she's good with it. Like that's what she wants. She wants some head scratches, um, which is a very appropriate place to scratch your bird. Um, you want to stay neck and above when you're petting them. So it's not a reproductive stimulation. You go under the wings, you go near the butt. And so they're going to start thinking, whoa, let's get busy. Um, so you want to stay up high. Um, and so she knows she gets her scratches and then she goes on her perches and then she just rides around wherever we go. Um, and she's super content with that. So that's really important is, um, is just teaching you guys as owners, as guardians, really not owners um, of these birds that um, there's appropriate way to handle them. There's an appropriate way to interact with them. And as much as the, these owners want to do this, you impress upon them that that the um, the outcome could be devastating. So devastating that it's, it's euthanasia for these guys. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna touch on is abundance weaning. Um, it's one of my favorite books that um, is no longer anywhere. I can't find it. But the general idea is that when I get the privilege of seeing birds as a baby, it makes our lives so much easier because we get to teach you how to be the best possible bird owners. And abundance waning is please don't let one person talk to the bird and one person feed the bird. Please don't feed the bird the same thing. Please don't never change the cage or move the cage around. Abundance weaning, which is exactly what it means, is at the time of weaning, this is the time to change everything in the bird's life. You move the cage to a different room, you move the toys around, you change the perch material, you change who feeds the bird, you change what you feed the bird, you change everything. So this bird is so used to change that when the bird is one year old and you're having to change your schedule and instead of working from eight to five, now you work from five you know, through the night, um, the bird doesn't freak out. Um, when you have to go on a vacation and you have a pet sitter come in, the bird's like, oh, I'm used to all kinds of things. Like, no worries, I got this. Um, and they don't destroy or feather pick themselves because they are not used to all the different stimulations. So different sounds, different sights um, is the most important thing you can do for your bird. So I love that. And then there's some websites um, for stimulating the forage. Um, and that's it. Well, there's so much more. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You can publish them. That would be great.
Um, but also anybody can get a copy of this if they want one. Um, so if anybody that's watching on the website has a question, ask away. You guys have a question. You guys have a question. Ask me anything. I covered a lot of information. You guys are like, ah, I know all that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I got all that. It's so basic and easy. What about flat stones? Yeah. 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 Just like in the cage to just yeah. sit. Yes. Flat stones are great. Um, it's just a change of environment. So, oh, which is really good because nature is wonderful. So I love to use fruit tree branches um, and then I'll strip the leaves from them, wash them with gentle soap and water, leave them out and dry. So then you've got like all different perch sizes and perch materials safe, they can chew on them. Um, and then flat stones in there is another really great way. Like they can perch on them, they can rub their beak on them um, and that's lovely, yeah. Oh, bottle brush, yes. Excellent. Yep. yep, that's awesome. Yeah, bottle they brush is flowers. great. They eat flowers, yeah. So anything in nature that you can take and bring into the cage. It's a huge undertaking to own a bird. Um, I don't think anybody who owns a bird and does a great job will disagree. It's definitely different than a cat or a dog um, because you're asking them to stay combined in a small area and is your you know moral obligation to make that environment as absolute best as you possibly can. So that they're happy and they're mentally stable. Um, that's it. Who sees emergencies? What to do in an emergency? Good. I like it. Bleeding. Blood feather. Good one. So great question, which is what to do at home if your bird breaks a blood feather or injures their toenail and you can't stop bleeding, um, pack it with baking soda or flour. Um, usually they're not going to bleed to death. Although there have been an instance when um, a pet store trimmed seven blood feathers on a cockatiel and um, by the time the owner got to me, the bird had passed. Um, but usually just one blood feather, you're going to be able to stop the bleeding. So don't panic. Be calm. Capture a bird. Um, pack it with baking soda or flour until you can get somewhere that you can. Sometimes you don't even need to come in. Sometimes you're fine. Um, another possible injury is if your bird is flighted, um, please don't keep the ceiling fans on. Um, turn the ceiling fans off. We've seen some horrific injuries with ceiling fans and flighted birds. Um, so just be aware that um, some bad things can happen there. Um, head on injuries if your bird flies straight into a window. Um, please just take it and put it in a very small dark box and give it about um, three to six minutes to recover and, and they usually will recover just fine. But I would probably say call your vet in the morning because um, some pain meds may be needed. Um, the other thing too is to be real careful with toys that have strings or strings because little tiny strings can get wrapped around their toes or their ankles and you may not see them, you may not notice them. And all you may see is that a Part of the toe starts to swell and so um, what's happening is that the blood supply is being cut off and then um, there are times when we have to actually amputate so any toys that are flaking tipping we don't want zinc toxicity get them out of the cage any strings um, or anything that's stringy you may want to get out of the cage to be um, safe for your bird um, and then I have another um, possible. Oh, and then that makes me think about leg bands. Um, so only in certain circumstances do we recommend leaving the leg bands. Some uh, breeders may want to keep the leg bands on, but the leg bands will uh, potentially get caught on these guys. We've also had to amputate legs because the leg bands were too tight. So I talked to owners and counsel them and recommend removal um, almost across the board if possible. And the other thing too is those leg bands can get caught in a toy and so they'll be hanging from um, yeah, from their cage or on the bars and then they're stuck. They'll break their legs. Um, it can be really dangerous. So we really recommend getting the leg, bang, leg bands off. Great question. I'm going to put that slide in. I love that. Yeah, that's another great thing. Um, so sometimes the first vet visit is very stressful. And so we may end up just doing a physical exam and we may be talking and perhaps we want to do blood work, but we may have you come back because we're talking to you about diet, 
So we'll have you come back and we may spread out different things that we want to do. Um, we really try as best we can in a confined amount of time to make it as stress-free as possible, but it is still really stressful for these guys. Um, over time, they get to know us and they're like, oh, you know, I feel like they're rolling their eyes, like, oh my God, I'm here for my nails again. Um, and they're not as stressed, but those babies have no idea what we're doing to them. So the babies are really, really scared. And so it's important to go slow with the babies, talk to the babies, um, so they're not super stressed. All right, it's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you guys for sticking with us with all of the weird technical difficulties that we've had. Um, and stay tuned next month for our next lecture series. On bioenergetic feedback. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fascinating. Yeah. Have a, have a great night, guys. Bye. Oh, wow. yeah. What is it? <laughs>